Hey, what's happening? This is Jerry here, at Wealth Dynamics. And uh, this was not a planned live, but I'm gonna go ahead and do a live video here on Facebook. We'll post this on YouTube also later. Um, but I wanna give you a kind of an impromptu rationale on crypto and investing, okay? Um, this is very casual. I'm just sitting here chilling, having my tea. I've got uh, black licorice tea with some monk fruit here uh, with an actual black licorice hard candy dropped inside. I'm a black licorice fiend. So d disclosure, uh, everything I say in this video is coming from a guy who loves black licorice. Most of you guys probably hate black licorice. Take that as you may. But I wanna talk to you guys today, just again, very casual about crypto and about investing, okay? Um, this is not an attack on crypto. This is not a should you invest, should you not. I'm not giving you any sort of advice here. I'm just gonna give you my mindset, how I look at things. If you disagree, fine. If you agree, great. You know, that's not really the focus. I think that a, a unbiased dialogue needs to exist on this topic because I don't think right now it does. I think right now we have two camps. We have the camp that's for crypto. They've gone all in. Nothing you say, do, or, or show them is gonna change their mind on crypto, and that's fine. People do that with politics, religion, whatever else, right? And then you've got the group that's against crypto, and nothing you say you know, or show them or do is gonna change their mind either. And so we have basically two different groups that are fighting, and they're all pulling out their own facts, and it's getting kind of into a tone of, of antagonizing each other. Um, I've seen some angry attacks. I've seen some covert attacks. And one thing I know is that when when an area has fallen into that zone of human emotion, honesty is usually not any, any longer considered, right? It's more about winning, it's more about being right, saying whatever needs to be said, doing whatever needs to be done in order to beat the opponent, okay? So I'm telling you, I don't own any crypto right off the bat, we'll get that out of the way. Um, I don't know that I ever will own any, own any crypto, okay? I'm not against it in, in the sense that I'm gonna talk you out of doing it, I'm not for it in the sense that I'm gonna talk you into doing it, I'm just gonna share with you my, my opinions, okay? Now, the first thing that I wanna talk about, and you guys can feel free to comment too. If you're in the comments, keep them positive. If you're negative, I'm not gonna address your comments or, or pay attention to them. But um, if you're in the comments and you want me to cover something, um, feel free to drop those in the comments. I think I can see comments here. Let me, I haven't done a Facebook Live actually in quite some time. Let me see if I can moderate my own, uh, my own feed here on Facebook. But uh, I wanna talk first about what cryptocurrency is, okay? Because there's a lot of titles for it. There's a lot of, um, I would say, marketing claims. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, beingnesses given to it, associated with it. What is it actually, right? Um, and so from, again, my understanding, I'm not, you know, into it from a technical standpoint, but I've done en enough study to know what it is. It's, it's a technology, okay? It's a blockchain technology. Um, it's a ledger system. It keeps track of transactions. Um, it's kind of almost like a digital transference of, of value of whatever is being transferred, right? If that's US dollars, great. If that's euros, great. Um, but it's kind of like a road. It's kind of like a digital road and you can send things from one point to the other point on this road. And it's also a road that has very high surveillance. You can keep track of what's been on it, who's been on it, when they were on it. And so you can really verify what's been traveling on this road, okay? Um, now, okay, great. I see, I see my, my comment feed here. Again, if you guys wanna share this, go ahead. Um, I would love to, uh, to have more people watch this, get the word out. We will put it on all of our channels after. But that's kind of what cryptocurrency is, right? So we're really looking at a blockchain technology when we talk about crypto, okay? Now, the title of cryptocurrency, in my opinion, is actually quite misleading. And the reason why is it actually doesn't have a single use case yet of an actual currency, meaning nobody is paying their taxes in crypto right now. Nobody is settling bills in crypto right now, okay? And that, again, it's not a statement of for or against, it's just a statement of what is. This is, this is the truth. It's not actually ever been used as a currency, okay? Maybe, maybe between, you know, bartering between friends, but I could, I could say that about, about you know, like I, I grew up in the, in the sticks, right? Like people bartered all the time. I, I watched one guy one time barter, um, you know, a, a, a 24 pack of, uh, of, it wasn't even good beer. I forget what kind of beer, but he traded it for a beat up truck, okay? You wouldn't look at the truck and you wouldn't look at the beer and say that it was, it was you know, a currency. You would just say that they bartered. And so I think that that's the truth with crypto is it's not actually being used as a currency. Um, and that's the first thing to understand about it. We know what it is, right? It's blockchain technology. It's a ledger system. Um, and, and that's what it is. It's not a currency. It's not digital gold. It's not the smart person saving. The kind of, none of those things. It is what it is. It's cryptocurrency. It's a, block, a blockchain digital ledger platform, and it's used for transferring value 
it really, it doesn't have to be value. It, it would be anything you want to transfer. Okay. Now the, the security aspect of it is that the, the transactions have to be settled. We're getting now more into what it does, right? So particularly on Bitcoin, I don't know about the other platforms. I don't get into them. Um, with Bitcoin, there's an accounting system that has to be in place. So when a transaction goes out, um, a digital account has to be made. There's an algorithm that has to be solved to validate the transaction and then it exists. It's real, right? And so this is called mining. You basically have people on digital tra calculators solving the algorithm, right? Now it's not actually mining. Like you're not digging things out of the ground and mining. It's, it's, it's an idiom is what it is. It's, it's a, using a word in a sense that it's not actually used like raining cats and dogs. It's not actually raining cats and dogs. It's just raining really hard. Mining is not actually mining. It's actually the solving of a digital math problem. Right now, whenever I look at, at a thing, right? Not even an investment, I was going to say a thing. I like to understand what is its purpose? What am I going to use it for? Right? And this is for me, one of the reasons I don't own any crypto and I probably never will is there's no purpose for me. Right? I don't, I don't need to have encrypted transactions. Like I'm fine with people seeing where I spend my money with my income. I report it all to the IRS anyways. I'm not out there committing tax fraud. So it's not, it's not a, an item for me to be like, oh man, I really need to have privacy on my transactions. Okay. Like I know this live stream, it's being monitored, like you know, Facebook and whoever they share my information with, they know exactly what I'm saying. They know where my address is at. I know they're probably watching me on my computer. They're probably looking at me on my cell phone, right? Uh, Edward Snowden proved all of this to us way back in the day. So we already know that privacy doesn't really exist. If the government wants to get at something, they're going to. I'm not a person that particularly, particularly believes I need a bunch of, um, you know, arbitrary privacy. Sure, I don't want you peeking in my, in my windows when I'm here in my apartment, but at the same time, there's certain things I don't care about, right? And one of those things is, all right, I know people are probably looking at my stuff online. I know I promote a ton, right? So I'm putting a lot of it out there anyways. Privacy is not something I'm very focused on, right? Now, the other one is, is um, you know, the, the medium of exchange standpoint, which again, Crypto has not actually ever had a use case of doing yet, right? I'm not looking for a different medium of exchange. I know you guys all take dollars. If I want to go buy a product or a service from you, I'm going to give you dollars. Like there's nothing wrong with that system. Okay. From a standpoint, strictly speaking of medium of exchange, like, okay, an acceptable medium of exchange. If it's corn, I'm going to use corn. If it's gold, I'm going to use gold. If it turns out to be a cryptocurrency, then, you know, it turns out to be a cryptocurrency. Okay. But the difference is, and there's this, this point that I want to make. Um, I call this the, the triangle of wealth, earn, save, invest, right? Earn is the top point of this triangle. Save is the next point. Invest is the final point, right? When I earn, I earn in currency. If I'm in the United States of America, I earn in US dollars, right? If I'm in Europe, I earn in euros. If I'm in Asia, I might earn in yen, right? The currency is irrelevant. It's basically just the agreed upon mechanism of transferring value that other people in a general area accept. Okay, not a single currency is ex that, ex that has existed is still around today, which means all of them have failed. Every single one of them have failed. They're all garbage. They're all shit. I don't care about them. It's going to change. I already know that whatever the next one is, I'm going to use it. It's kind of like a Facebook update. It's like, good, you updated it. It's still Facebook right now. I got to figure out the new little bell. I'm not into, all right, what kind of currency am I going to use? As long as you accept it and I accept it, I'm fine with that. Right now that's on the earning side. The saving side is where I become concerned, right? Fiat currency, which is what we have as a US dollar, it's backed by nothing. Its value is only de declared by the government, which is basically backed by um, coercion and violence, right? If you, if you don't use the US dollar and you try and use something else, you're gonna go to prison, A, because you can't pay your taxes and anything else. So if you try to, your taxes aren't gonna get paid. They're gonna lock you in a box and put a gun in front of your face. Or if you try and create your own currency, they're gonna lock you in a box and put a gun in front of your face as well. Right? So these are things that I would look at and say, okay, when I'm thinking of storing value, I don't want to store my value. I don't want to save in a currency. It goes back to the purpose. The purpose of a currency is not to store value. It's actually to transfer a value. It's an exchange, right? So if that's crypto, fine. If that's a paper dollar, fine. If that's digits, if that's corn, if that's whatever, fine. But the thing that I store my value, the thing that I save in, I want that to do two things. Number one, I want it to not go down in value over time. Right? That's why it's called a store of value. If I store something, I'm saving it. Am I not? Right? I'm saving the value. I'm, I'm making sure that it doesn't go anywhere. And number two, I would like it to not only store the value, but I would like it to kind of appreciate. I'd like the value to maybe go up so that I have more value than I started with. Okay? But the number one thing I don't want it to do is go down. Right? 
okay? Now, when I store something, like when I store um, this tea in this cup, right? I can understand the cup, it's there, I see how the tea stores it. It's important because I can use it later, right? I can drink out of it, it serves my purpose. With crypto, it doesn't do that for me, right? When I store value, what am I really doing? I'm actually exchanging the currency, in this case, it would be dollars, for something that I know is going to be there, right? For me, I like tangible items, a real store of value. And this comes down to what is value. There's two types of value, and I do not see this being talked about anywhere. There's something called intrinsic value, and there's something called extrinsic value right? Intrinsic value means that something in and of itself is valuable regardless of subjective viewpoint. Objectively, it's valuable, right? Meaning you could take it to, the, the example I like to use, you could take it to a tribe in the middle of the Amazon jungle. They would look at it and they would naturally deem it valuable because valuable it has intrinsic value. So what are some of those properties, right? Land, definitely one of them. Wars have been fought over land. People love land, it's intrinsically valuable. You can use it for, for food, you can use it to build shelter, you can use it to create you know, a sphere of protection. So land is definitely one of those stores, okay? Um, another one is gold, 6,000 years, store of value, right? So I can look at that and say, okay, so if I was in the Amazon jungle and I offered a native tribe that's you know never seen the modern world a piece of land, they would take it, right? They would say, yes, this is valuable. If I took gold and I offered them a brick of gold, they would see it and they would take it, okay? And we already know that they would take it because they already have. I could do this with, with uh, commodities. I can do this with food. I can do this with water. I can do this with oil, anything that has intrinsic use, right? And so that's really the big thing with intrinsic value is to look at, okay, again, what's its purpose? What can it be used for, okay? Now, the intrinsic value exists separate of the extrinsic value, meaning if I have this cup of tea, right? intrinsically, this has got some value, right? I know that there's, there's, there's water here. I know that there's probably some herbal properties in the tea. I know that there's gonna be a little bit of carbohydrates in it. It's gonna give me energy. Whether you like the tea or not, it's got value. You can't refute the value that it has, right? And, and so it comes down to, okay, regardless of the extrinsic value, which is my next point, there is intrinsic value. Now, what is extrinsic value? Extrinsic value is subjective value. It's subjective value. It's the value in the eye of the beholder. Okay, when somebody sees something, it's the value they individually place on that item. It's almost more of a significance. See what I'm saying? I like black licorice tea, right? Because I like black licorice and I like tea. So I have you know, a level of extrinsic value that's maybe above and beyond the intrinsic value of the tea, right? Like I said, there's hot water, there's, there's thirst quenching properties, there's probably some herbal stuff, there's carbohydrates, there's flavor, there's things that are intrinsic, but above and beyond that, I just like tea. So I would be willing to pay extra money to have it I would go out of my way to have it because that's what I prefer and that's extrinsic value, right? This is actually a trading term. When you're trading stocks, the intrinsic value is the actual like real book value of a stock. You can look at the earnings, you can look at the track record, you can look at the underlying assets and you can actually calculate a definite finite value which is intrinsic. Extrinsic is whatever the price would be. So you have the value here. If the price of the, tr of the stock trades above the value, right? Then it's got a high extrinsic value. That difference here, the, the gap between what it's actually worth and what it's priced at is extrinsic. Extrinsic meaning outside. That's subjective, right? A great example of this would be residential real estate. Okay, there's a level of intrinsic value with having a property and having a roof over your head and having a septic system and having all sorts of different things that you get with owning a home, right? But when you buy and sell, you're going off of the comps, the comparable prices in the neighborhood, which has nothing to do with the actual value of the home. Everyone overpays for their house because the extrinsic value is more than the intrinsic, okay? Now, what, is, what does all of this have to do with, with crypto? We talked about earning and concurrency, right? We already know crypto is not a currency. It's not being used as one until taxes are paid and, and goods are settled. And actual crypto, it's not a real currency, right? And you can say, oh, I can pay in crypto. No, no, you actually can't, okay? These things where you see businesses advertising, I can pay in crypto, that's, they're not actually accepting the crypto. They have a point of sale system that takes your crypto, instantaneously exchanges it into dollars and gives the business dollars instead because they don't want your crypto, okay? They want your dollars. So they'll, they'll take your crypto and the technology instantly exchanges it for dollars. It's no different than going to a currency exchange stand at the airport and saying, I have euros, I wanna buy in dollars, and they're boom, they're gonna give dollars, they're gonna give you, you know, the money to settle in the country that you're in. 
Okay. Imagine walking up to a cash register and you have, you have euros, you have francs, you have whatever. And the cash register says, Hey, great. We don't accept those. We accept dollars. But if you give us your Euro, we will give you the appropriate exchange value of dollars minus our transaction fees so that we can then have the dollars and we can do business. They're not accepting your euros. They're exchanging them for dollars. They're not accepting your Bitcoin. They're not accepting your Ethereum. They're exchanging them for dollars. Therefore, it's not actually serving as a currency. The dollar is because ultimately that's what the business is accepting. Right, that's ultimately what you pay your taxes in. So on that point, moving back into the value thing, extrinsic and intrinsic, right? Cryptocurrency, and this might hurt, you're gonna disagree with me, I might even lose some followers on this, has no intrinsic value, okay? If you, if you isolate it and you take away the potential for price increase, right, let's, let's strip that off, right? And we just say, okay, if you, if you don't buy it because it might go up in price, what are you really buying it for? because okay, the price thing we've already discussed, that's extrinsic. That's what other people, that's subjective, right? Objectively, if I remove the factor of the price might go up or I might get rich by owning it, right? What am I actually getting? To me, I'm not getting anything. I'm getting a digit. I'm getting, it's literally like physically, it's a nothing. I'm getting air. I'm getting an idea. I'm getting, you know, a, a string of digits that I can send stuff back and forth on. Right To me, that's got no value. As an investor, I don't need that. That doesn't solve a problem for me. It doesn't help me in my life in any way, shape, or form. I can do all of that already just fine. Okay, Could it be cheaper? Sure, maybe it could be cheaper through crypto, but I'll tell you what, my bank fees aren't that much. So the amount of time that I would have to spend to learn about using this new medium of exchange probably is not gonna compensate my time for the savings I get by avoiding a $25 wire fee with my bank. You see that? My time is worth several thousand dollars an hour at this point in my life. So every hour that I would invest in learning about how to send currency back and forth on a crypto medium, on a blockchain mechanism, would be time lost. It would be thousands of dollars per hour lost. And if I'm not recuperating that through the saving of fees or the saving of time, then it's not actually financially worth me doing. It actually is a liability to me. And this is important because this is what I see. I see a lot of people um, spending a lot of time researching this and learning about it, which is great, that's fine. I'm all about financial literacy. You guys know that I, my number one rule is don't invest in something you don't understand. So more power to you if you're actually putting in the research. But the other thing too is what is the purpose of investing? The purpose of investing for me and for my clients is to achieve passive income that exceeds my savings, expenses, and taxes so that I no longer have to trade time for money. Okay, so check this out. If I have to spend copious hours learning about cryptocurrency, right? So that I can understand how it works so that I can use it. Did I not just trade time for money? Right? Because I'm hoping it goes up in price. I'm hoping I, I get some kind of an economic benefit, but I had to trade hours of my time. So if it takes me three hours to learn about that cost me six grand that cost Jerry Fed is $6,000 to learn about that in three hours. Do I get more of that on the back end? I don't think I do. Okay, so there's no intrinsic value. It's literally, it's a nothing. It's a digital code. It doesn't serve me in any way. There's no value delivered. There's no way for me to, to, to put a stat behind and say, this is the amount of value crypto earned me or saved me in and of itself via the functions it performs. Not, not thinking about if it's gonna appreciate. Again, that's extrinsic. We'll get to that in a second, okay? Now on the extrinsic side, sure, it goes up in price. We know that, right? Now, price and value are two different things. Again, value is intrinsic, price is extrinsic. The, the amount of money that I pay for it, right? What I get it if, out of it if I sell. Those are all things that are extrinsic, not intrinsic. Okay, so I can buy it and I can hope that I can sell it to someone else for more in, in the future, right? That by definition is speculation. It is not investing, okay? And, I, and this is something I think is a huge misunderstanding for people Speculation is not investing. Okay, speculation means I buy something, whatever it is, at, a, at, at one price with the intention of later selling it in the future to somebody else at another price. Speculation, right? If I bought it at one price with the intention that I hope it's gonna go up, I hope I can sell it to someone else and, and that I'm going to get wealthy off of that or even make money off of it, I am by definition speculating. There's no arguing with that. That's a factual statement. That's a literal definition of speculation. Okay, so that's probably 90% of the people that are buying crypto and involved in crypto right now, they're speculating. Speculating is no different than going to Vegas. Speculating is no different than day trading stocks. It's no different than flipping re and rehabbing rental properties, 
right? Or, or not even rental properties, just properties in general. It's the act of buying at one price and then hoping I can sell at another, okay? Now, at least with a property, there are things I can do to impact the price, right? I can buy you know, a foreclosed property. I don't personally do this, but I could buy a foreclosed upon property. I can fix it up, I can paint it, I can do things to bring the worth or the intrinsic value of it up so that I have a better chance of selling it in the future. With crypto, I don't have that. Okay, I have the market. I, I buy it and then hopefully it just goes up in value, hopefully it just goes up in price and then I can sell it later. Okay, now here's the problem. Price is gonna be dictated by a couple of things. Okay, in the investing world, the first thing that price is dictated upon is earnings. When I buy a thing, what does it pay me? With crypto, it pays me nothing. A token in and of itself, a, a digital currency, does not actually pay me anything. Okay, now if, if, I, if I, and this is another, you know, kind of bunny trail, a lot of people are like, well, you know it does, you can yield farm and you can stake it. No, what you're doing is you're doing, you're taking the, the crypto, you're doing an unsecured loan to a financial institution who's not showing you their books, they're not showing you their assets and liabilities, they're not showing you that they can pay you back. There's no guarantee of anything and a lot of times there's no security behind it. What are they, they doing? They're loaning it to hedge funds. Right? It's literally the fractional reserve system back once again. They're loaning it to hedge funds so those hedge funds can add more crypto to the market and trade on it. Again, trading is different than investing. They can make profits on it and they can pay you a yield. That's not income from crypto. That's income from lending. Two very different things. I do the same thing with my gold, guys. I buy gold, I borrow against it, I loan it out to someone, they pay me a yield. Okay, that's not gold paying me a yield. That's a loan paying me a yield. That's gold acting as security, collateral, store of value. Right? So if I buy a digital token, it's not going to just pay me a yield unless somehow it's being loaned out because it doesn't have any earnings. You see that? So that's the number one thing I would look at to dictate value. If it was a business, if it was a stock, if it was a loan, I would look at what am I going to earn in cash? What am I going to earn in income from owning this asset? That's the first thing. The second thing is track record. Okay? Track record meaning it's got to have a not just earnings but a history of earnings. My minimum is five years. If I don't see a five-year history of earnings at the minimum and preferably 10 or higher, I'm not doing it. Okay, again, this is just me personally. I'm not saying this is how you have to think. I'm not saying you're right or wrong for doing it. I'm just telling you this is my rationale on the subject of owning an asset. It's got to have earnings. If it has earnings, I want to see five yeah, at a minimum of consistent profitability. Okay, crypto does not offer me that. And in the investing world, that's the number one thing you would look at to calculate value, right? There's actual mathematical formulas for that. Okay, then I would look at the intrinsic value, right? If it was a business, if it was a stock, or if it was real estate, what, are, what is the intrinsic value? The utility value, the material value? Let's say it was a piece of property. How much is all the wood worth? You know, the, the land, the septic, the whatever. If it's a loan and there's collateral involved, what's the collateral worth? Because that's what I'm gonna foreclose upon if the loan goes bad, right? So I wanna see what's the intrinsic value involved. And then finally and lastly, the fourth one is the extrinsic value subjectively, when I look at the market, what's the demand for this thing? Okay, that's the last thing, because at the end of the day, I don't buy things with the intention of selling them later. Okay, I buy things with the intention of holding them to generate passive income so I can earn my financial freedom back. So I'm not looking at when I buy this, who's gonna buy it from me at a later date. I'll hopefully nobody, I don't, if it's good, why would I sell it? If it pays me every month, why would I sell it? Right? And so that's what I've got to look at is, is those are the factors. Crypto doesn't check off those boxes for me. So as a store of value, as an asset, as an investment, it just doesn't do it. Now, let's talk about what does it do. Okay, we, we all know the price goes up, right? But the, the fundamental mistake that's being made, tea break really quick. The fundamental mistake that's being made is that people are just touting the rate of return. And I'll admit, it's quite impressive. The, the price has gone up exponentially. It probably will continue to for quite some time until it reaches the point where people start selling it, okay? And that's what I wanna specifically pinpoint. When people start selling it, the price will go down. Why does the price of crypto go up? It doesn't have earnings, okay? It doesn't have intrinsic value. So what makes it go up, okay? Net buyers exceeding net sellers. That's the only reason the price goes up, guys. This is, this is economics 101. This is a basic fundamental. When you make a market, right, and, and the, the amount of buyers exceed the amount of sellers, then the price goes up. Okay, because what are people doing? They're taking dollars and they're pushing it. They're transferring it into cryptocurrency. Think of it like a swimming pool. Every time someone gets in the pool, the water goes up. Water goes up, water goes up, water goes up. 
there's gonna be a maximum capacity of how much water the pool can hold, right? But it doesn't mean there's actually more water in the pool. It means there's more people in it. It's displacing what's there and it's causing it to rise. This is called market displacement, okay? What happens when people get out of the pool, okay? Not only does the water go down, right? But typically what? There's nasty water. It's, there's sweat in it. There's urine. People probably defecated in it. Like no matter what, the pool is going to be gross. That's why they chlorinate pools. But in addition to that, when people get out of the pool and everyone's finally out, there's actually less water than what you started with because everyone had some water on them when they got out. They took water out of the pool as they left. And so what's left is actually a reduced and depreciated version of what was originally in there. Okay, and this is, this is what happens with, with crypto. This is what happens with uh, meme stocks. If you have more buyers than sellers, yes, the price will always go up. This is the definition of a Ponzi scheme. Okay, because what happens when people start selling, they start pulling currency out of it. The, the, the sellers then exceed the buyers, right? You have an offset. And so the price starts dropping. Okay, as the price starts dropping, the last guy in the pool is the one that pays the price because he's the one that didn't get to get out with some of the good water. He's the one that didn't get to get out with gains, okay? Now, the other factor too that I wanna point out is crypto is not something that most of you guys are selling. You're buying it and it's called hodling. Hold on for dear life is actually what that acronym means. You're hodling and you're, you're again, speculating, hoping the price goes up, hoping that in the future you're gonna strike it rich. And so you might look at it and say the price went up, but factually speaking, you have made no money until you cashed out and took your profits. That's a fact. Because if it wasn't a fact, you would pay cat, you would pay taxes. Right now, there's actually a, a talk in, in Congress about making capital gains taxable on assets that haven't been sold. It's called unrealized capital gains. Okay, and there's a big pushback against it. People are saying, "Hey, no, no. If I buy, you know, if I buy this can of of of, of sparkling water and it goes up in price, but I don't sell it, I shouldn't have to pay taxes because I didn't realize a gain. I didn't make any money." Great, that's true. Same thing applies to crypto. If you bought it at $10 and it went to 10 million, you have made no money till you sell. You're not profitable till you sell until you realize your gains. There's no money there for you. There's potential for it, but guess what? The price could go down tomorrow too. So, so when you look at a lot of these guys that are you know, in, in our space, that are on Facebook, that are on Instagram, that we know that made money in crypto, they didn't make money in crypto yet because a lot of them have not exited. They haven't taken their gains. Therefore, they've made no profit as evidenced by the fact that the IRS is not going to tax them on it. Now, who has made gains? Okay, this is the other point I wanna to get to. JP Morgan has made gains, right? Bank of America has made gains. Hedge funds have made gain, gains. These are the guys that are now saying, okay, we're, we're adopting crypto. We're integrating it. We're gonna make crypto ETFs. We're gonna start you know, allowing it to be traded on our floors. They are making gains because they're pumping the market up and then they're selling. Right? Like when, when a crypto ETF happens, like an exchange traded fund, they're getting retail investors into it. Guys, this is classic Wall Street. They want more people in the pool so that the water continues to go up so that the banks can pull out as much water as they can without you guys noticing. And then when it crashes, what do they tell you? They, say, they tell you buy it on sale so it goes up again. And then they just repeat the same cycle. They dump more retail money into it. They pump up the price. They promote it. Why do you think there's so many fancy flashy ads? I literally saw on YouTube, unrelated video. I think I was watching an, an Impractical Jokers clip. It had nothing to do with crypto. But a commercial came on for Coinbase telling me that I could earn free money, free crypto, if I go learn about crypto on their platform. Why? Like, why, why are you paying me to learn this, right? And so I look at that and I say, okay, great, there's advertising. The, the money behind the advertising wants more people in it. Why do they want more people in it? Because they're gonna pump the price up, they're gonna sell. Okay, Elon already did this. Elon did you guys dirty last year, man. I don't know why you guys still like Elon, right? He says, you know, Tesla, we're gonna accept Bitcoin as payment, which really they're not. They're accepting US dollar. They're using one of those Bitcoin exchanges that I talked about. Okay, and then he goes and he tweets, Bitcoin, Doge, this going to the moon, all that. Everyone buys it. And then he goes on SNL. He talks dirty about crypto. The same week says they're not gonna accept it as payment anymore. And then he sells and makes, I think it was like hundreds of millions of dollars. And he goes like, correct me if I'm wrong, 150 million. It was what I, I believe, if I recall correctly, what he made in profits off the crypto. Okay, that's called a pump and dump. This is what the institutions are doing. This is what the big investors are doing. Okay, because when you're in crypto, you, you are speculating, which means the baseline of that market is the same as day trading. The same players are in there, the same techniques are in there, the same market makers are in there, right? So if you're day trading, 
you're either an issuer, which means you made money by just creating the stock or creating the crypto. That's who makes money when you day trade, okay? You're either a professional trader, right? I'm not one. I guarantee most of the people watching this stream are not one. I know a professional trader. He trades for me on Forex. I would never do it myself. A, because it's not passive. B, because my time is worth about two grand an hour and I would actually lose money learning about it. And C, it's not something I want to be an expert at. Right, so there's professional traders in there. There's issuers, professional traders. There's market makers, right? Like these are people that have so much firepower that they can manipulate an entire market and then sell and make money off of it and then cause you guys to lose it and then convince you to buy more while it's on sale, right? And then there's inside traders. There's people that have inside information and they trade in the market as well. Those are the four groups that make money, right? Now in the issuers in crypto, this would be the actual people that develop the coins themselves. It's just coding guys. It's not like they're, 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 you know, creating the cure for cancer. Anyone that understands and is good enough at coding could technically make their own crypto. Okay. So we need to stop acting like they walk on water. It's, it's they're just good at coding, right? They're making money by issuing it. Number two, we actually have professional traders in this space. Guess who the professional traders are? These are banks and hedge funds. Okay, so you on your little app, you're not gonna be, be able to do very much damage or even defend yourself against banks and hedge funds. They are in there and that's exactly what they're doing. They're manipulating the market. Then there's market makers, right? Giant firms, ETFs, right? Governments, like, like players that, that are in the Forex markets, like you, you, they're called whales, right? These people are in there. And then finally there's inside traders. There's people that have inside information, right? And they're gonna buy and sell based on that information. Unless you're in one of those four categories, I don't think you have any business trading. I don't think you have any business speculating. I'm not saying you can't, but I'm saying, is it really the best idea? Why don't you pick a fight with someone your own size, right? Not these four groups of whales that make money on trading, okay? Now, the other factor that I wanna look at is what is crypto kind of relative to? Because it's not a currency. It's not truly a store of value. It is definitely a speculative digital asset. But when I try and think with, okay, well, what is it like? What can I relate it to so I can understand it better? The best thing I can relate it to is a pre-revenue tech stock. A pre-revenue tech stock, right? And what I mean by that is you'll see these companies that they come out with a great technology, right? Whether that's an accounting software or a whatever software, and it's gonna solve a lot of problems. It could even be a social media platform. That's a, that's a tech stock, that's a software, okay? Blockchain is that, it's a technology. So I look at these companies, they come out with, with technology that has a good benefit, it can impact the world, it can do all this stuff, but they don't have any revenue. Okay, and so when they don't have revenue, what do they do? They go to angel investors, they go to venture capitalism, they come up with these wild valuations based on, I don't know what, because they don't have revenue. If you've ever seen Shark Tank, you know exactly what I'm talking about. These people come in with these crazy valuations, the number one question they get asked is, okay, what are your sales? What are your earnings? When they say there's no earnings, what do you see the sharks doing? They write notes on their pads. They're like, all right, cool, there's, there's no earnings. What do I actually think the value is? So this is like a pre-revenue tech stock. What is the MO of a pre-revenue tech stock? It's to get enough of a user base. Oftentimes that user base is free. We're maybe gonna sell their data or do something else to monetize so that we're attractive looking enough to a big enough firm or a big enough buyer to sell at a multiple, an exit. This is what Elon does all the time. Elon is not you know, a profitable CEO. The PE ratio on his stock at Tesla, freaking terrible, right? All these tech stocks, you can look at them, even the ones that do have earnings, the price earnings ratio is worse than a bank account, meaning you would make more in, in income by just putting your money in the bank, right? But it's these valuations. It's okay, well, despite the fact that it has no revenue, I'm gonna sell on the fact that it has a high price. Okay, and again, that's extrinsic value. If I can get you emotionally vested, if I can hype it up, if I can get enough opinion leaders and influencers saying it's a great thing too, then I can pump the price up and sell for a profit. It's the same exact mechanism with crypto. No different, okay? But the difference is, at least with the pre-revenue tech stock, there's like a group that I can hold accountable, right? But when it's an anonymous, anonymously issued currency, there's nobody I can hold accountable to that. There's nobody that I can take to court. There's nobody that the SEC can find because at the end of the day, nobody knows who developed it. Sure, they can go after the platforms, they can go after the exchanges, but those are really just the middlemen, right? There's nobody to hold accountable to what's actually happening. So those are a lot of the reasons I don't get into it. Now, the other thing that I wanna get into is these exchanges, right? These are, these are the people who are really making the money in crypto because they, they charge fees, right? They facilitate your transactions. And so they charge fees. They're able to make, you know, percentage-based fees and flat fees. 
And um, I think Coinbase is a good example. The one Coinbase went public, I think it was last year. Their, their IPO was done in dollars, not in crypto, which means they are exchanging their shares of stock for US dollar. They're not saying we're gonna do an IPO in Bitcoin. We're gonna do an IPO in Ethereum. They're not saying that at all. They're saying we're gonna do an IPO and in exchange for ownership in this crypto you know, exchange company, we want US dollars. Guys, that, that should be a serious out point. Why in the world would they be doing it in US dollar? Wouldn't they be at least saying, hey, you can do it in Bitcoin? No, they want dollars. You have to go to Wall Street and you have to buy a share of stock in US dollars to own, right? So that's that's something I look at as well. And, and there's, there's a lot to be said for um, in this space, looking and analyzing rather than listening. Okay, like even with the rate of return, right? The rate of return goes up. Why did it go up? That's always the first thing. The rate of return is a statistic. It's not in and of itself. It means nothing. It represents something. What is it representing? Why is the rate of return going up? Why is the stat rising? Okay, in my own business, I do that. When a stat goes up, I'm not like, oh, the stat went up. Let me go look at the stat and, and idolize the stat and fondle the stat. No, no, I look at what was the causation behind that because I want to repeat it. I want to do it again. Okay, you can't do that with crypto because nobody can honestly and it has ever honestly told me why the, why the price goes up. Okay, they, they get into all the PR of why it's so neat and slick and new and why it does all this stuff, but they've never been like, yeah, here's the technical reason why the stock went up, why the price went up, why, why, the, why the coin went up. They're, none of that's there. If it goes down, like same thing. And so that leads me back to my main point of, okay, you look at the return, you've also then got to pull the string and find out why the return. What is that term return representing? And if you can't find that out, you have no business getting involved. And I'm not telling you this from a, me being you know, the authority figure and scolding you. I'm telling you as a fellow investor, that is a seriously bad idea. It's the equivalent of a company coming to me and saying, hey, invest in my firm. And me saying, okay, let me see your revenue. And they're like, my revenue and profit is this gigantically astronomic number. And then I ask to see their books so I can see where they got, got the numbers from. And they're like, oh, we don't have any. Do you really think I'm gonna invest in that company? No, because that, that smells like fraud. Right, so these are these are all the things I consider. This is not anything about whether it's good or bad that you have crypto. I think you know if you own crypto, 90 percent of you, maybe more, are simply doing it because you think you're going to make money more money off of it. You're speculating and you're calling it investing and you're naming it something different than it is. And this is where we get catchphrases like digital gold, which isn't true, or you know uh, the smart person savings account, which also isn't true, or even a currency, which also isn't true. Right. So if you're speculating. That's fine, just call it what it is, you're speculating. You're, you're hoping that you can sell it later at a higher price. Okay, because I don't, I don't think most of you guys are sending transactions through it. I don't think most of you are utilizing it for its privacy properties or any of the things it's supposedly supposed to do for you. I think you're buying it and hoping the price goes up and that's it. I think 10% of you guys maybe actually are true warriors and you're like, yeah, let's overthrow the Federal Reserve and, and let's make this a new currency system. Okay, which leads me to my next point. Okay, and I, and I love this sentiment. I wanna say I'm fully on board with let's overthrow the Fed. I think the Federal Reserve Bank, Central Bank, and the IRS, it's all freaking terrible, and it's the reason why there are wars, famines, racial inequality, poverty, you name the issue, somehow the Federal Reserve is involved, somehow a central bank is involved, every single time throughout history, okay? So what, is a, what does a central bank actually do? They issue currency, and they manipulate interest rates, right? This is called uh, controlling the money supply. Okay, so US dollars come from the issuing of a currency, of our currency from the Federal Reserve Bank to the US Treasury. Then the US Treasury distributes it into the country. We all use it, okay? Now, this is a group that, that you know, we've really consolidated, but this is a group that, that, like I said, they've been involved in every war we've gotten in, uh, political stuff going on, racial stuff going on. Their, their hands are on the strings of it all, okay? Think about it, they earn interest on every dollar you spend. Because every dollar the United States Treasury issues to us, the citizens, is borrowed from the Federal Reserve Bank. Therefore, if this, if this were multi-level marketing or insurance sales, they override every single dollar in circulation in the United States of America and in the world for that instance, okay? And, and they've enforced this since 1913 in the US, they've been in existence consistently. Since 1913, they've enforced this. They've enforced this through coercion. They've enforced this through violence. They've enforced this through enslavement. 
Okay, so, so we're dealing with people that are worse than the mafia. They are worse than the mob. They're worse than, than friggin', you know, the, the dictators we hear about in South America and the Middle East. And they're right here in our country. And so if we were really going to overthrow them, what would that look like? Okay, I'm going to tell you what it looked like. In, in 1776, when we declared war on Britain, that war was, was not, it had, it had nothing to do with tea and taxes. Right? Ironically, I'm drinking tea. We were all taught that war had everything to do with taxes, tea, and tariff. Benjamin Franklin in his biography writes that that war was actually over the fact that the United States colonies had issued their own currency. And the Bank of England told the King of England they're not allowed to do that. You need to tell them they have to use British pounds. They have to use our currency. So when England came over and enforced that and they eradicated the, the colonial dollar, right, the, the currency that the colonies were using, I think it was called the colonial script, Right? When, they, when they eradicated that and made it illegal to use, we then declared war on Britain. Okay? We used guns, guys. Children were going to war and fighting against soldiers. This is what it took for us to break free from their central bank. Okay, so if we were going to break free from a central bank, it's not going to happen on your freaking iPhone. It's not going to happen on Coinbase. It's going to happen with, with literally millions of us rising up and saying we're going to use violence and force to break free from this because that's how it's always happened. And that's also how it's always been lost, right? Like this isn't Skittles and rainbows. It's a cute thought, it's romantic, it's a great idea, I agree with it. But the amount of force necessary to do that is being severely underestimated. Okay, and I know that that's maybe a little bit tinfoil hat. That's, that's the reality though. Like if you've not learned that yet, boom, there you go. Like I might've ruined your Thanksgiving, but at least you know the truth, right? So if we were really going to break free from the U.S. dollar, we would need to break free from the United States Federal Reserve Bank. Two ways to do that. Congress votes them out, which they're not going to do. They're in business with the Federal Reserve Bank. A big portion of the profits from the, the, the Fed go into the U.S. Treasury. They're not going to get rid of one of their main profit centers. In 2020, right? In 2020, the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank generated enough profit that if it were a privately, and it is a privately held corporation, but if it were like some, a company, right, it was actually the most profitable company in the world. Think about that. It was more profitable than any other entity in the world. It's not federal. It is privately held. It is a corporation, but it's not something you and I can go invest in, right? So who owns it? Central, the, the chain banks own it. They're a member banks of the Federal Reserve System. They own it. They make money off of that system. They also get to buy and sell and get brokering privileges. And then the U.S. Treasury owns it, right? Like, and not, not even owns it. It's not owned. It's separate. The profit gets transferred. That's, that's why it's never going to go away. Our government makes money on the system. The banks make money on the system. The people that own the banks make money on the system. The IMF makes money on the system, right? The Bank for International Settlements makes money on the system. World Bank makes money on this system. It's not gonna go away because Bitcoin came out. Literally, like seven billion people on the planet, we would have to have enough people where we in, in numbers outnumbered every single government employee, every single elected official, every single banker, every person that profits from that system. We would have to outnumber them in an amount of people rebelling and also all of the people rebelling would have to be armed and willing to go fight for us to break free from that system. Like, and, and I know that that doesn't sound idealist. I know that that sounds very skeptical, but that's honestly what would have to happen because that's what happened last time. An entire country rebelled against the Bank of England and Great Britain and we went to war and it was a long war and it was violent and a lot of people died and we finally won, right? And then we got right back in bed with central banks thanks to Alexander Hamilton like 20 years later, okay? And we've been there ever since. So this, I think is pretty much all I wanted to cover on the topic of crypto. If you're in it, I'm not saying you shouldn't be. If you're a client of mine, like I'm not scolding you. I'm saying... Realize A, you're speculating. B, it's not a currency. C, it's not a store of value. So what is it? It's a speculative asset. That's the truism. That's the reality. That's the as is about crypto. Okay, and if you're involved in a speculative asset, you need to be confronting it that way. You need to be thinking of it that way. Your strategy needs to be based on that. And you really at that point are a trader, not an investor. Okay, trader meaning T-R-A-D-E-R, -E not trader like you betrayed, but you trade crypto. Buying at one price, selling for another, okay? And if you're not willing to put the time in to learn trading and you're not willing to do all of the things that I've talked about in this video, you probably shouldn't do it. Okay, you probably need to be, to be you know, taking a few steps back. And actually, one more point. I know this is kind of, kind of a casual talk, so this just came up too. There's, there's this idea out there that the 
kind of goes back to my prior point that the majority of people that are buying and holding crypto are doing it because they see the problem with the Fed and inflation and all this stuff and they're finally, they're finally seeing it's wrong and fighting back. That's a nice thought, completely off base. Guys, 80% of America or more is financially illiterate. They don't even know how to earn more than they spent. Okay, 60% of America does not have more than $1,000 in saving, which means they don't even know how to keep the money they have. If you survey people, they probably don't know that the dollar is not backed by gold anymore, right? They're swimming in credit card debt. All of their income goes to taxes, loans, and Wall Street, right? And so they're not financially literate enough to be like, hey, inflation exists and this is how it works and the Federal Reserve system is here and it's evil and this is a responsible move that I'm taking to fight back. No, guys, they're watching Cardi B videos, they're going to work every day and they're clocking out at five and binging on Netflix. They're going to the bar. Like people are not as, and not to again sound skeptical, but I think it's the reality of the situation. They're not as financially literate as we're making them sound. There's a community of you guys that are, that's awesome. There needs to be more. That's one of my missions is to spread more financial literacy. But this idea that the masses, the freaking, um, I'm on Lyft, right? I'm taking a Lyft. The Lyft driver is talking to me about how he trades crypto. The Lyft driver, Okay, I forget whose quote it was. Someone quoted when you're at the, at the shoe shine station and the shoe shine boy starts talking to you about stocks, that's when you know there's a bubble. Basically, that's what that is. When the Lyft driver is talking to me about buying and trading crypto, that's when you know mass, mass just random people have gotten into it. And it's not like they're in control. It's not like they're educated. It's not like they're responsible. Okay, they're just jumping in because they think that they're gonna make money. Okay, and I'm a young guy. I wasn't. I wasn't. Um, I wasn't gonna. Say, I was gonna say not alive. I wasn't old enough to have been investing in the tech bubble. Okay, a lot of a lot of you guys aren't old enough to have been. You'd have to be in your 30s or 40s to legitimately be like, okay, yeah, not even 30s. You'd have to be in your 40s to legitimately be like, yeah, I was an investor during the tech bubble. A lot of us crypto guys, like my age group, okay, I say us crypto guys. I'm not a crypto guy, but my age group, we're the ones that are doing the crypto stuff. We're the the heavy adopters of it. We're the ones pushing it. We've never actually been through a real bubble as investors where we had money and skin in the game, right? And so we've never done that. There needs to be, a, I'm not gonna say humility, but there needs to be a little bit of an understanding. That there's probably a lot of stuff we don't know. It's easy to say I'm this you know, winning investor and I'm, I'm killing it when everything's great. But when there is a real economic calamity, when a bubble does happen, when things aren't going so well, how do I respond then? What do I learn then? Because I can't be like, hey, I'm 26 year old, years old. I just bought a bunch of Bitcoin in my, in my Coinbase app and I made 5 million bucks and now I'm freaking the wizard of Wall Street, right? No, I'm, I'm, I'm an inexperienced investor who got lucky on a speculation. Try duplicating it. Try doing it again, right? It's easy to buy a lottery ticket and, and, and the guy that wins just got lucky. Watch him do it again. If he can do it again and again and again and again, maybe he's got something. Maybe he's got a system that we need to go learn. But if it's, I bought the thing and it went up and I got rich and that was the end of my story. Guys, anybody can do that. There's no skill, there's no knowledge. It literally is you picked the right thing at the right time. Okay, so if that's you, like congratulations, go make smart decisions with your profits. Definitely take your, your profits so you can say I actually did make the money, right? But unless you're consistently doing that over and over and over, then there's not a technique that you have. It's not skill, it's not anything special, there's not any literacy behind it. And, and if you were consistently making money at it, that would make you a good trader. You're good at trading cryptocurrency. I don't wanna be a cryptocurrency trader. Okay, now I'm gonna wrap this up with, with one more thing, okay? Investing at its root, the etymology where that word comes from, it means to clothe your capital. Okay, you can go look that up. Etymology, derivations, that's where words came from. So invest means to clothe your capital, right? And I use this example, but I'm gonna use this again because I think it's a great way to sign off. And this is really what I use in real life. When I look at an investment, I really do think about clothing my capital. I'm gonna put clothes on my money. I'm gonna cover it in something, right? So when I clothe myself, how do I go about that? First thing is I only wear clothing that I like, okay? This is huge, because if you're gonna invest in it, why would you invest in something you don't like? Now, this is only one of many points. Some of you guys do like crypto, so that's valid. Some of you guys don't and you feel like you're missing out on the boat, but you don't really like it. And so you're willing to get into it so that you don't have FOMO. But at the end of the day, it's like, do you actually like this thing? Because I don't like it. The reason I don't like it is it's invisible. Same reason I don't own stock. Same reason I don't own publicly traded bonds. Same reason I don't own ETFs, right? Same reason I don't own gold certificates. It's not in anything. It's, it's invisible. It can be manipulated. It was created in a boardroom out of thin air. 
Okay, so I don't like that. I like hard assets. I like gold. I like silver. I like life insurance. It's a real contract. I like private lending. I like real estate. I like oil and gas. I like businesses. I like investing in myself. Those are real things. I can see them, right? If I was going to wear clothing, I wouldn't wear invisible clothing. I would wear real clothing I could see and touch and feel, right? That's just my own preference, but that's the first point is invest in what you like, okay? Number two is invest in what you understand. Okay, if I'm clothing myself, I would only wear clothing that I understand. I'm not going to wear clothing I don't understand. As a guy... Other guys can probably relate. If you're a female and you've ever gone shopping with a guy, you can see this right off the bat. There's certain things we don't understand. I don't understand high heels. I don't get it, right? I would never wear them because I don't understand it. I don't like it, but most of all, I don't don't understand it. With investing, if I don't understand something, I'm not getting involved. That has to be a rule. And And I encourage you to use that rule. Even if you don't like me and you're like, yep, I'm unfollowing Jerry Feta forever after this video. At least take the, the, the insight of, okay, great. Well, on your, on your journey of investing, make sure you understand the stuff you're investing in, okay? For me, understanding means I can draw it on a napkin, right? Like I can, I can draw a picture of how it works and, and explain it to someone else and they would be like, oh, okay, I got it, right? I can draw private lending on a napkin. I can draw owning gold on, on a napkin. I can, own how my, or I can draw how my business works on a napkin. Okay, so that's understanding. Number three is it has to fit me as an investor. Okay, like I wouldn't wear clothing that doesn't fit me. Just like I wouldn't wear investments that don't fit me. I'm not gonna put my, my, my investments into, into assets that don't fit my personality. They don't fit me as an investor. Every investor has their own personality type. Right, D- different things that fit you, different things that don't. I'm not somebody that, that, that I enjoy having to look at a chart every day. Okay, that's why I like private lending is did they pay this month? Good, I'm not gonna take their things away. They didn't pay, oh, I'm gonna take their things away. Like I, that's, a, that's a thing that I don't have to put very much attention on. It can just happen in the background. I'm a passive investor because I want passive income. Therefore, anything that's not passive is not something that fits me. Okay, so that's the third point. Fourth point is it has to fit the things I'm going to use it for. Okay, I use the example that I'm from Alaska, okay? In Alaska, if I'm going to wear clothing, like you have to wear clothing that fits the occasion. If it's, you know, the week, I I think it's been in Alaska right now, this week has been like 20 below zero, right? So you wear a coat, you wear a hat, you wear gloves, maybe you wear a face mask, maybe you wear boots, but you definitely don't wear what I'm wearing now, which is a Henley and some shorts and no socks, right? Because what am I gonna be doing? In Alaska, I would be going outside. I would be skiing, snow machining, walking in 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 the ice. I would have to dress for the occasion. Right in Florida, I don't do that because it's hot and I don't need to do that. So I need to dress for the things that fit what I'm gonna use them for. I need to invest for the things that I'm going to use the investments for. Okay, for me, what am I using them for? Until I'm financially independent, which is again, passive income that exceeds my savings, expenses, and taxes so that I no longer have to trade my time for money, then every investment I do has to generate me passive income. If it doesn't, it does not fit the thing I'm using it for which means I don't invest in things that don't pay me passive income right now. All of them have to do that, okay? Next thing is I'm not gonna overpay, right? With clothing, I bought this on Amazon. My shorts, I don't even remember where I got them from. I got them super cheap. I'm not the guy that's gonna spend $300 on jeans. Could I? Certainly. I think it's a terrible decision. So when I'm investing, no different. If I'm clothing my capital, I'm not gonna overpay for it. Meaning if if something is extrinsic value significantly outweighs its intrinsic, I'm not buying it. Right? So in my opinion, the, the intrinsic value of a cryptocurrency is very low because the utility that it provides for me is, is valueless. I don't need any of the things it does. Okay? And, and, and based on use case, neither do you guys because you're not using it as a currency. It's not being used like we talked about in this video. So, so when I look at the, the price, it's all extrinsic, which means it's too expensive. You would even agree that it's at the top of a cycle right now. My brother invests in it and he texts me. He's like, hey, it's at the top of the cycle probably going to do some selling off because, you know, at this point I want to take profits. It'll come back down. I'll trade it. That's again, trading. That's a different, different thing than investing. But if it's at the top of the cycle, it's overpriced. It's too expensive. I'm not paying more than I need to, right? Like a pair of shoes. I know that a Chinese person made them for, for, for 30 cents an hour. Why would I pay $400? makes no sense to me. Okay. So I'm not going to overpay. And then finally with clothing, right? If I'm going to wear clothing, the first thing I'm going to wear is, is the things that are vital right? What's vital? Underwear is vital. Everyone needs underwear. What else is vital? Pants, shorts, shirt, right? Socks. Those are all vital, right? But if it's like a $300 accessory belt, that's not vital, 
right? Or, or people are into like those satchels and, and purses and, and fanny packs again. I'm not gonna pay $200, $300 for a fanny pack that's not vital, right? I could, if I really wanted a fanny pack, I could go to Goodwill and get one for like 10 bucks, okay? But my point is, when I'm investing, I'm also then looking at not only do I like it, do I understand it, does it fit me, does it fit my goals, right? And, I, and I'm looking at, again, you know, the, the aspect of is it, is it something that I'm overpaying for, but I'm also looking at is it vital? Is it something that at the end of the day, people need? No, crypto is not at the end of the day something people need. It could go away today. Other than the people that lost money, nobody would feel it, right? And that again speaks to what value does it bring to the world. Right now, it doesn't bring enough value that any of us would notice if it left, other than financial loss. It's like, for example, if you could take a comparable magnitude of cars, if vehicles were taken away from us, that would be a significant impact because we all, we all use vehicles. We use them for transport. Right? If the roads were taken away, that would impact us. Right? If oxygen was taken away, that would impact us. Right? If TikTok was taken away, like, all right, great, nothing is going to happen. We'll move on to the next social media platform. Cryptocurrency gets taken away, nothing's going to happen. Okay? We'll, we'll move on to the next thing. Right? And so that tells me it's not, it's not socks, it's not underwear, it's not shirts, it's not pants. It's the $300 Gucci belt. Some people want it, sure. It's, it's not something that's a necessity. It's definitely a want. Okay, and so those are all the things I look at. And then again, if you look at the basics of it, I'm gonna wrap up on this point or otherwise I'll keep going for hours on this. If you look at the basic of it, it is taxed and regulated like a stock. Cryptocurrency is taxed and regulated like a stock. If you buy it and you sell it, you pay taxes on your money, right? Currency, you don't do that. If you buy a dollar and the dollar has more purchasing power the next day when you spend it, you don't pay taxes on the difference. You see that? If it was a real currency, then you wouldn't pay taxes when you sell, right? They're regulating it like a stock, right? The SEC is getting involved. We're having legislation come out to regulate it. So it really is like a pre-revenue tech stock, okay? So this is, this is again, my impromptu. I probably missed some points. I might've even been wrong on some points. I would love to know your feedback if this is something you agree with me on. If I gave you a different viewpoint on it, go for it. Uh, one more thing I just thought of. Guys, stop comparing it to gold. They're not the same thing. They never have been, they never will be. Gold is a physical asset, crypto is an invisible nothing. Then it's not the same, right? Like gold is used in jewelry, crypto is not. Gold is used to transmit electricity, crypto is not. Our Federal Reserve Bank has $500 billion in gold. They don't have any in crypto. Our dollar was once backed by gold. It was never backed by crypto. They're not the same thing, okay? This goes back to, again, like marketing. When, when you're in an investment vehicle where the price is dictated by net buyers surplus over sellers and the buyers know that they're gonna hype it up because that's the only way they can pull out and make money and make profits is if they get more people in so these marketing phrases it's digital gold it's this it's that they're not true like if you look at the reality of it and say is it true no it might sound catchy it might it might be something that's really cool to say it might feel significant but it's not actually a true statement okay if crypto is digital gold then gold is is physical crypto like they would be one in the same digital and, and, and physical form of each other. That's not true, so it's not the case, okay? So I'm gonna wrap up here before I get into any more rant on this. Um, again, if you're gonna buy it, buy it. If you're gonna, if you're gonna you know, like, you know, stay away from it, stay away from it. What I wanna make sure of is you understand what you're doing, you're speculating, and I wanna make sure that if you're in it, or if you're not in it, you're not convincing other people that they have to, right? You made the decision to get into crypto, that doesn't mean your friends need to also. These statements of what is it going to take for you to change your mind? Why don't you have just a little bit in it? You're, I literally had a guy tell me yesterday because he found out I'm 29 years old and a multimillionaire and he found out I didn't own crypto. And he's like, but you're supposed to. Like he was saying like I was the stereotype of, of a person that's supposed to own crypto. That's like, that's ridiculous. Okay, so if you don't own it and you're listening to this and you hear people talking like that, don't do it just because they're saying you're supposed to or why, why don't you own any or what's it gonna take to get you to change your mind or why don't you have a little bit in it? Your investment decision is up to you. And if you don't like it, if you don't understand it, if it doesn't fit you, if it doesn't fit your goals, if it's overpriced, if it's something that you don't actually uh, think has utility value, like, you know, like vitality towards it, don't get involved right? Don't get involved just because someone told you. Because at the end of the day, if you make money, you can't repeat it because you weren't the one responsible for doing it. They were. If you lose money, there's no one to blame because they're not your financial advisor. 
You have to be able to look at your own investing and your own viewpoint and make that decision. So guys, that's all I got for you today. Uh, we'll have to do more of these talks. I hope everyone, regardless of whether you agree with me or disagree with me, I still like you. I hope you can still like me. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Um, you know, Enjoy it with your family. Watch some football. Do whatever you're going to do. And uh, I'll talk to you guys all next time.